theatre is modern. The River Avon, timeless, flowing through Stratford as when Shakespeare was born 400 years ago. And he too is for all time. His work's immortal. He grew up in this little market town and loved it. Though it could not contain his vision, that sweep of imagination, that soaring mind that beckoned him to London. Stratford-upon-Avon now celebrates his quarter centenary. They have to satisfy the tourists, needing mementos of their visit on this very special year. So special that the Shakespeare Centre has been built as a memorial to him and a research workshop where all who love his works can, as it were, refresh themselves. The Honourable Eugene Black, Chairman of the American Shakespeare Committee and recently President of the World Bank, opened the centre. Lord Avon, formerly Anthony Eden, was present as Mr Black unveiled the plant. The birthplace of Shakespeare, 1564 to 1616. A short life, but what accomplishment those years brought forth. We know he went to Stratford Grammar School. Tradition has it that in these classrooms, the young Shakespeare acquired his little Latin and less Greek. One wonders if the schoolmasters of his day detected his infinite promise. Familiar in countless illustrations is Anne Hathaway's cottage at Shottery, just across the field from Stratford. Anne was eight years his senior when he married her as a young man of 18. Nobody who goes to Shakespeare's country, as it's called, fails to visit Anne Hathaway's cottage. This bed is 400 years old, and any self-respecting baby would estimate the cot to be about the same. The legend goes that at nearby Chalcot Park, Shakespeare was discovered poaching deer. Sir Thomas Lucy of those days, no doubt, had strong views on poaching. The story says that over this style, carefully preserved nowadays, the poet-to-be escaped and for safety went to London. Thirty-seven plays written in 23 years came from that migration. But he did not forget Stratford and retired there. The present house is not the one he bought. That was demolished 200 years ago. But in its garden are the foundations of the original dwelling. He had returned to Stratford a prosperous man. In the chancel of Holy Trinity is the tomb where he was buried. His imperishable work accomplished. 400 years after his birth, Stratford is joyful. This is the birthday. St George's Day, too. The Mayor of Stratford-on-Avon led the procession along Bridge Street in the manner observed on the birthday for more than a hundred years. Representatives of 115 nations were paying homage to the poet who belongs to the whole world. Lord and Lady Avon were there. At the birthday luncheon he proposed the traditional toast to the immortal memory. Wreaths and posies were to be laid at the tomb in Holy Trinity. But first, the ceremony of unfurling the flags. The processional route now lay by way of Henley Street and Shakespeare's birthplace to the church. It was said that he was not for an age, but for all time, nor was he only for one country. Here was proof that if his appeal is not universal, for nothing is quite that. It is for every generation and every people to whom English is understood. Duke of 
Edinburgh motor to the Shakespeare Centre, which he had asked to see before going to the birthplace and carrying out the remainder of his party programme. He was received by Sir Fordham Flower, chairman of the Birthplace Trust. The Centre is an international tribute to Shakespeare's memory, for many countries have contributed to it. On glass panels, John Hutton, who designed the west window of Coventry Cathedral, had engraved characters from the plays. Unmistakable is Richard Crookback. From left to right, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, and Richard again. Necessary in this uncertain age is the vault in which the centre keeps its almost priceless library of rare editions. They include the quarto and folio of the early printings, but for which Lear, Hamlet, Othello, and the comedies and histories might have been lost to mankind. Sir Fordham Flower presented the Duke with medallions to commemorate the royal visit on the historic day. From the centre, Prince Philip went over to the birthplace, where 400 years ago an infant lay mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. He was the Shakespeare, who as a man knew that all the world's a stage. Did he as a boy creep like a snail unwillingly to school? Perhaps. At least the desk is here, at which he sat in the grammar school. Outside again, to the Stratford, bent on ringing the last drop of joy from this great occasion in the intervals when nature wasn't ringing yet more drops of water from a too full sky. The Shakespeare exhibition, planned by Richard Buckle, illustrates the life of Shakespeare against the background of his times, all executed in unusual artistic forms. In ceramic tiles, scenes from Romeo and Juliet. Queen Bess, under whom Shakespeare and all the other Elizabethan dramatists and poets flourished. Now to the post office, besieged by people wanting to buy the envelopes with the special Shakespeare stamps. Demand far exceeded supply, but all that were ordered will be postmarked April the 23rd. The future stamp collectors will treasure them highly. Here's one going to Australia. At the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, the birthday play was Henry IV, Part I, Falstaff's play. A merry choice to put before a most distinguished audience. Presented now was the young director of the theatre, Peter Hall. Meanwhile, the well-graced actors were preparing not to leave the stage, but to make their entrance. Always a nervous time. Entertaining the thousands outside whom the theatre couldn't accommodate were the children with their country dances. A glimpse of the merry England of olden times. would have loved this scene. He who bequeathed to all the world a heritage defying time. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme.